Um, hello, everyone. This is Talk Show Presents. I'm Keith Williams, your host. Um, hope everyone is having a great weekend so far. And joining us today is Dr. Douglas Garland, a uh, practice orthopedic surgery. He's been dealing with that for over 37 years in Southern California. Dr. Garland was a clinical professor of orthopedics at the University of Southern California, where he authored over 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles with over 600 citations. Um, the Tail Poppy Syndrome is the most comprehensive book on the subject. Uh, Dr. Garland, I want to welcome you to the show. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, so I pretty much have uh, mentioned uh, the standards about you in your bio. Could you, uh, first of all, uh, let everyone know personally, who is Dr. Garland? Oh, I grew up in a small farm town in central Iowa, about 400 people. I um, had no great desires to be anything. And my father, there were seven kids, so he sort of kicked me out and said you had to go to college to get ahead. So I went to college and was kind of aimless. And it was a Jesuit school. And I was, uh, after my first year, I was a dorm advisor and uh, the priest called me in his office and asked me if I knew what I wanted to do. And I said, no. And he said, well, you would make a good doctor. And of course, you know, that was more education, more money. I figured you had to be smart. It's, it just seemed out of my league. So I said, no, I had never thought about that. And he said, well, you would make a good one. You should go for it. So I thought thought about it a few days and decided I would make a commitment to try to get into medical school. And after I was lucky enough, I got on the dean's list. I really had focus, got on the dean's list, got into medical school in, in three years and graduated, went to Vietnam. This was in 19, I graduated in 69. I was in Vietnam in 71. Came back and did an orthopedic residency at Tulane University in New Orleans. And then went to Southern California to do a year of research at USC, and I fell in love with LA, and I stayed there for 37 years, and now I'm retired on the central coast of California. The interesting part for your listeners are I was head of a spinal cord injury unit in LA. It was the largest unit in the country and one of the premier institutions in the world for spinal cord injury. I was president of the Spinal Cord Injury Association at that time and was planning on going to Australia to uh, go over their six programs that they had in the country. I came back from the meeting that I was at setting all this up and there was a note on my office and it said my office had moved down the hall. So I went from the big corner office with the window down to a little cubby hole. So I finished my day up and just nonchalantly mentioned it to my wife when we were having supper. And at that time, there was a really popular book out, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? And she said, my goodness, they've moved your cheese. Uh, they don't want you there anymore. And so fortunately for her, she had good emotional intelligence. I would have gone back and got into a big fight and tried to get my office back and try to see who cut me down. And instead I went back, I put all my research, I brought in two big plastic um, garbage cans through all my research, all my publications, all my awards, anything that I had to do that was associated with academia into that, put my key on the desk and I walked out of the facility. And I called the people in Australia to tell them that I wasn't coming and they wanted to know why. And I explained to them and they said, well, you've been tall poppied. And that term was so strange to me that I had to ask them two or three times and explain it two or three times before the, before it sunk in. 
And then I kind of understood it. And I fin I was, had a private practice. I finished up my private practice. And then when I retired, which is now eight years, I spent the first year doing background research. And then I began my book tour of trying to figure out what the tall poppy syndrome was and why I didn't know about it and why it seemed to be everywhere but in America. So that that's uh, been my journey now for the last eight years. Uh, I never heard of the term before, so. Uh, oh boy, that's just amazing. I bet you've been tall poppy too. Most people, when I tell them what it is, they say, geesh, that happened to me two years ago. Okay, uh, so what is the tall poppy syndrome? So the tall poppy syndrome, the concept is to see a field of poppies and one taller than the rest. Uh, hold on, discussion. before I get, get into that, uh, what does it mean to be tall poppy? Well, you see the poppy that's taller than the rest. So you want to cut that poppy down so that everybody's equal. And we're kind of going through that in America now. My original premise for the book was that we didn't have the tall poppy syndrome here because we we were an individualistic society, which we're the only country in the world like that. And I thought that's why we were spared the tall poppy syndrome, or at least knowing about it. Of course, that turned out not to be true. I had, I wrote the first draft and through doing my premise that individualism prevented tall poppy syndrome I took a lot of journals and periodicals and looked every day for examples of the tall poppy syndrome's occurrence in America. And I could find it easily every day in the newspapers. So of course I had to throw the first draft out. In fact, my conclusion was, was that tall poppy syndrome is more common in America than any country because you have to remember that we have more tall poppies than the rest of the world. So our, our culture, our meritocracy, our capitalism, we we create tall poppies almost by the bushel basket where where a country like Australia, which is the tall poppy syndrome is the most prevalent in their culture, which has to do with uh, they were founded as a penal colony for England. And that concept of everybody being equal has stayed with them their entire culture. So our country was not formed like that. But because I felt that um, we had so many tall poppies, uh, our country is actually worse. So, so who, who would consider to be a tall poppy? Well, that's a good question. And that's the first question that came came to me as I was writing the book was, uh, I was going over this with a friend once and and he said, well, you can't be, you couldn't have been tall poppy because you're not a tall poppy. So the first thing I had to do was to figure out who were tall poppies and who weren't. And the other thing is, is that my tall poppy is not necessarily your tall poppy. So the whole con, it's a concept. And then from that, you have to learn a lot of things which we're talking about today so the first thing to learn is that you don't have to be a tall poppy to be tall poppy and how that happens is i broke the tall poppy syndrome down into two main categories one is peer to peer and the other is true tall poppy or the public tall poppy so the peer to peer is the most common and we don't know about it because it's not newsworthy but it begins in your family. We had seven kids in our family. We we had a birthday. You only got one birthday party in our family. You could have 10 people over. You could spend $10. And that stayed true for all seven kids. They didn't vary from that because they want to keep everything equal. And subconsciously, I have two daughters and I did the same thing with, with my own daughters. So subconsciously and consciously, it begins in the family. And of course, that's carried on into the schools. Now, I went to school in the 50s. And at that time, Sputnik was, had been launched. And there was a real push for excellence in the schools. And they, 
they wanted valedictorians and smart people and smart people to go on science and join the space race. So my education was a little different than it is now. Now there's a tendency to be everybody gets the trophy and there is no valedictorian. So that equality or um, egalitarianism is now in our schools. And you have a certain amount of um, economic uh, egalitarianism. You usually have your home is what you can pay for it. So your home, really, you're in a neighborhood that uh, is usually in your economics. And that's your peer to peer group. And you can have um, neighborhood pride where you fix your your home up. And you can have neighborhood envy where somebody else has a better home than you do. So envy is the big driver of peer to peer, which we're talking about, or your tribe. And the neighborhood pride would be to see somebody's home and you covet that. So using good envy, you try to emulate them and fix your home up to match your neighbor. Now, some people have are lazy, low self-esteem, or they just feel they can't match their neighbors. So instead of doing that, they try to disparage their neighbor, or they could even uh, key the fancy car that they have in the drive. So that's how your neighborhood envy plays out. Then you go to work and you have the same thing. You have... Um, competition within, especially in America, within the workforce, and you want to move up the ladder of success. So you you may or may not work hard to try and get the promotion, but certainly if there's somebody competing for that same position, then you're going to try and cut them down so that you get the job. So that's the peer-to-peer, -peer, it's driven by envy, bad envy, not good envy. And that's in contrast to the true tall poppy. Now, the true tall poppy, and once again, mine might not be yours, but it's going to be a politician, um, Brock. Uh, it's going to be a baseball player, a football player. It's going to be a movie star, somebody in the media, somebody that has a lot of money, somebody that has a big personality or something. So it's really a, it's somebody that's, that's, I guess, now the term is more of an influencer. So they would have a tendency to be the tall poppy. Now the tall poppy is going to still get cut down, but it's going to now become through justification. The cutter feels justified in cutting the tall poppy down. And that's through egregious behavior. And through my research, my egregious behavior is mainly driven by three bad emotions, Pride or hubris, that's the number one cause, excessive pride. Uh, lust or um, greed. So those are the three, three main reasons that most people get cut down. Most of them are males, if you think about it. Most of the males have a tendency to be prideful. Uh, the male CEO of a company is too prideful, he gets carried away, makes more money than the rest of the staff, his staff, they want to cut him down, or he has an affair with somebody in the office. So through that egregious activity, the cutter feels justified in cutting them down, because they're no longer a tall poppy. Um, there are a lot of, you know, examples that I can give, you know, for that, and you determine whether or not you know, it fits the term. Like, for example, the uh, Ellen Mosk, who uh, recently purchased uh, Twitter for multi-billion dollars. And once he got a hold of that company, he's basically about to clean the house. Would that, would that be a perfect example? You mean Elon Musk? Yes. Yeah, of course it is. Just watch how uh, everybody's um, fear Fear is also a driver because every you know the fear is now grasps the the public. It gets a little bit sticky. So 
I mean, a, a big study just came out yesterday that said uh, the media has a liberal bent and they have a tendency to cut down conservative people. And certainly that was Musk's problem. And one of Musk's reasons was, was that he felt that they were cutting down people within Twitter. So he wanted he wanted to purchase that and make it an open forum and try and make it completely neutral. And so, of course, now you have fear. People are afraid there's going to be change. And any time there's going to be change, that brings up fear and that brings down uh, people want to cut him down before he even know, knows what's happened. So they're judging him um, without anything to really judge him by because he really hasn't done anything yet. But the cutting has begun. Uh, people have left, which is a means of cutting down. Companies have left, which is a means of cutting down. And people are writing nasty things about him because of his actions. So that's a perfect example of the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, what about the cancel culture? Well, that's a good question. And the cancel culture is a big cutter of the tall poppy syndrome, rightly or wrongly. So rightly, I personally, I love movements. I study movements. Movements are usually driven by an injustice. So there you have your justification right there. And usually the movements are driven by smaller people, not tall people. The tall people, the, the tall poppy has the power. And so it takes a bunch of a group of small people, peer to peer, once again, little people bound, binding together, and they get enough strength to challenge the tall poppy. And the tall poppy through justification uh, then can be cut down. I don't, you know, it, theoretically, Twitter could go bust if all if people enough people leave, if enough um, media or ad people leave, you know, if, uh, Musk could be completely cut down. Now, there's I don't think there's reason justification for that at this time because he hasn't done anything yet. Fired a lot of people, rightly or wrongly. Who knows? We don't know that the reason. Although he says it's economic, but it's not bad behavior, but. Uh, he may be cut down inappropriately, but in the cutting, and to a certain extent, then some of his staff have uh, now been tall poppy themselves because they've been cut down. And that's what I call collateral da damage in the movement. There's, there's the true leaders or the reason you had a tall poppy cut down, uh, which is your movement with, that we're talking about, any movement. But within the movements, there's always a lot of collateral damage and a lot of people get cut down. I mean, you can look at what happened. Um, Trump was, um, I don't like to talk about Trump because he's such a lightning rod and uh, people turn off your podcast immediately if they hear that. But Trump, uh, Trump's a good example of collateral damage. If you work for Trump, uh, you kind of had that MAGA stamp on your forehead and there was a lot of good people got cut down because of Trump's associate because of their association with Trump, and they they really didn't do anything wrong. So the the problem, the problem, one of the problems with uh, cancel culture is uh, good people that are associated with the main cause become a symbol. And because of that, so anybody that worked for Trump now becomes a symbol of Trump. And they confuse this, confuse the symbol with the person, and they get cut down. And that that is how they they may may not even be tall, but they got tall poppy. So there's a lot of fluid in it seems like a simple metaphor. But trust me, uh, I spent now eight years studying and trying to go going through all the innuendos. So the book has over 600 references or citations. I, When I would make a statement uh, in a book, I wanted to have reason that I could make that statement so that people didn't try to cut me down for 
some inappropriate thing that I said. So, but uh, if you get the concept, uh, you 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 start to see it. You see it. You this is really it's a self improvement book because we don't have it in America recognized. But trust me, it is everywhere, and it's really bad in our government. It's bad in what I call the three letter departments, the IRS, for example, the DOJ, um, the FBI, they're all cutters of the tall poppy and the citizenry. And, and the original description of, of the tall poppy syndrome goes clear back to ancient Greece. And the story is, is that it was a governance problem one of the governors was having trouble governing one of the cities that they had acquired. And a messenger went back that for, that was sent back from that city back to the governor and wanting to know how to govern. And he went out to a wheat field and he lopped off all the heads of the wheat. And the person went back and told the, gov the mayor and the mayor knew from that metaphor that he had to cut down all the people that were opposing him. And then it actually became the tall poppy syndrome in Rome and in, in ancient Rome, the last kingdom, which was 500 BC, uh, where Livy, the great Russian historian described the same concept of gov governance, the king of um, Rome, his son was in the next town. It was Sextus and it was in the town of Gabby. And he did. He was having trouble go governing, so he sent um, his a messenger back to his father. His father walked to a t poppy field, and he lopped off the heads of the tall poppies. The messenger went back, told the son what had happened, and he immediately knew he had to kill all the opposing forces. So, the tall poppy syndrome was described as a government entity, and our government, not all governments, do it even our own, I think ours is as bad as any. And if you look now, uh, the premier of China, he just had a purge, he, he took over, this is his third term, which was illegal. They were only supposed to serve two terms. And he served his, he started his third term and he, he had a purge over there of all the opposing people that, that, he knew would be a problem going forward of the policies he wanted to implement. You can look at Russia and Ukraine. You can look at and say um, Putin is tall popping Zelensky and the country of Russia is tall popping Ukraine. So the tall poppy syndrome has any implication in society, whether it's local, your own tribe, whether it's more national and tall poppies or international. Once you get the concept, uh, it's an eye opener. And the book is a self-help book because once, uh, I'll give you an example why it's self-help. So here's an, uh, Will Smith and, and Chris Rock at the Academy Award. So who, who was to blame? That was an example of the tall, I'll just tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that's a tall poppy syndrome. And you would think that Will Smith, uh, tall poppy, Chris Rock, because of the remark that he said about his wife. First, he has to be an extremely prideful man in order to think that he could get up and slap somebody with the whole world watching. And secondly, he was driven by anger, uh, one of the cutters in the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, and, and worse, you want to, he's seeking revenge. And there's a saying that if, if you seek revenge, dig two graves. And the meaning is that is, is that your bad behavior has to be worse than the behavior of the person you're cutting down. Otherwise you couldn't cut them down. And that's usually a, prop, a bad proposition because that's really bad behavior. And I think the judgment was on Chris Rock. It was bad behavior or Will Smith. It was bad behavior on his part. The Academy kicked him out for 10 years. 
and he lost Disney, Disney contract and as well as other contracts. So he, the, um, the way you treat bad envy is kindness. So if you, if you look at Christianity, if you have a bad, bad emotions, such as the lust, greed, anger, envy, and laziness, there's a, a virtue that's opposite that. And if you practice that virtue, you overcome your bad emotions. So the bad, the virtue for bad envy is kindness. So if you remember, you know, to always be, always be kind, you're not going to have problems with the tall poppy syndrome. You're not going to be a cutter. So that's how you self-grow, even if you're not, I was involved in it. Uh, I grew personally almost, I have a chapter in the book devoted to uh, tall poppies, which is really a, the original draft of the book was how to become a tall poppy by my standards. And when I looked around, there were so many self-help books um, published every year. There's 10,000 self-help books nationally published. That tells you that uh, they may be good for, for inspiration, but they're not doing a lot of transformation. If people became tall poppies, you wouldn't need that many tall poppy books annually. So I threw all that work away and looked, looked to figure out how I could do something quite simple to be a self-help book. And it kind of was the similar to kindness. Uh, my my self-help, how to be not to be not tall poppy is servitude. If you serve fellow man, nobody's going to tall poppy you. And everybody in my in my tall poppy hall of fame were all servants and they were all tall poppied in spite of that. But most of the time, if you um, are tall poppied, you grow from that experience. So you can take Steve Jobs, for example. Steve Jobs was canned, uh, the board of, of Apple Computer canned him as CEO of Apple. He turned around and formed two two new companies and after that success he got uh, actually apple bought one of those two companies and pixar as you might know is one, the other one which of course now disney owns but was really a premier company and they bought the other company and then buying that steve jobs came back as a as the ceo of apple again and of course, this time around as CEO of Apple, he was a completely different man and put that place to the number one company in the world. He probably would, that never would have happened, I don't think, had he not been uh, cut down and did a lot of soul searching about himself and how he approached business and his fellow man. So sometimes uh, it can be a good thing as well as a bad thing. Well, the, the 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 chances the chance in in the peer to peer um, is is that the cutter is usually the bad person or has is more likely the bad person, and and he needs to if he's cutting people down if he's uh, he he needs to be called out. If you take the example of a bully, the bully really is a successful way for a low self-esteem person to make his way through society. It works for him when he's maybe even in his own house, bullying the younger kids, it works for him when he's in school and works for him in the workplace. But unless you call that person out, I mean, it's become his nature. So he, you know, it becomes his habit. So it, he doesn't think about it. So unless unless you call somebody out, um, they don't realize what they're doing and, and they can't change their behavior. The tall poppy syndrome, especially if you were to read the book, for example, allows you to change change your behavior. Remember that the emotion of envy is always on. I consider it to be the most prevalent emotion in society and actually um, the internet is driven by envy. Every time you turn on your computer, you're going to witness envy. 
usually bad envy, not good envy. But envy is a comparison, is your comparison emotion. So as soon as I saw you on our webcam this this afternoon, you know, I already checked you out. I saw you were wearing glasses and and where you were, and I'm making all these either rational or irrational impressions of you just by the first image that I see. So unfortunately, that's the way we are now. We don't we don't go to the cortical side of the brain anymore. We just start staying on our brainstem emotional side and we're making judgments for no good reason. So um, that's why the emotion of, of envy is so prevalent in our society because we're, we have the internet, we're looking at everything. We're looking at your car. We're looking at what you wear at school. We're looking at what you wear at work. All we're doing is comparing ourselves to everybody else. That's that's what our society is now. That's so different than Jefferson society with the ind individualized individual who was the citizen farmer who was out in the farm having no idea what was happening to farms removed from him. You were your own self and self-determined. And now our self-determination is driven by envy and usually bad envy. And if you look at politics right now, coming into the final three days of our election, what's driving politics right now? It's bad envy. They're, it's too late for them to try and improve on their image or whoever they are. They're cutting everybody else down because that's easier and that's faster. So if you, that's all that's happening right now is big. And kind of the same thing with Musk. There's a big cutting machine happening in our society right now. That's all that's examples a, of the tall poppy syndrome. And that's that's also, uh, you know, it's funny that you're talking about uh, the upcoming election. Um, we, you know, every time that we, you know, we deal with politics and we come into an election, we're seeing a whole lot of cutting down. You know, it's like if I don't agree with your values, you know, I'm going to be cut down. You well, know, I'm going to be cut down. I'm going to be I'm going to be cut down. I'm going to be called names. I'm going to be, an, you know, an outcast, a troublemaker or whatever, you know, whatever term that fits that description. You know, even if I am doing a greater good for the people, still going to get cut down. No, One that's of the not I agree. That's why if I say you don't even want to mention Trump or be in his administration. Be, be, if you, because, you were, you were because of with him envy, and, you know, you know, because they are driven by, you know, they're driven by envy. They're jealous. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're right. You know, they see something in you that, you know, they wish they have for themselves. You know, even people who, you know, presumably have, you know, money, fame, power, status, you know, they see someone of a great influence, you know, and they say, well, this person is coming on my turf, you know, I need to, you know, cut this person down or cancel them or, you know, or whatever, you know, the case may be, you know, I have seen that, you know, a whole lot, especially in, you know, the last, you know, four or five years, I ran for city council last year. And I saw it firsthand, uh, this tall poppy syndrome, you know, to where, you know, if you're not, you know, in that in crowd, you know, not only are you going to be, uh, you know, cut down, but you basically going to be outcast. My man, you've already figured it out. I told you at the start of the show, if, if once I told you, you would figure out about, uh, well, that's happened to me. So. You, but you're right about politics. It's split the country down now. Now, you, you know, races. Uh, I I tweet. If, I usually tweet every day. I don't do a lot of social media, but I still kind of do my internal research of seeing what's happening in society. And you know, races. Uh, cutter. Um, just. I mean, age is a cutter. I mean, we we discriminate subconsciously. Gender is a cutter. I mean, we have all these things, uh, unconscious bias that we cut people down. But uh, just now, you're right that the the thing is politics. As soon as you mention the other party, 
Boeing, there's a firewall goes up and you're automatically in the bad envy mode and you're worrying about anything disparaging or negative you can find about that person so you can cut them down. And it's driven by politics. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but um, what are the two forms of envy and their relationship to the tall poppy syndrome? Yeah, so so here's two, two important concepts for your listeners. First, there's a, envy and and jealousy are used interchangeably and they're completely opposite and they should not be used interchangeably. Envy is coveting what somebody else has or you want. And that also includes to potentially destroy their happiness. So it's not always necessary just to key somebody's car, but it's important to see that person come out and see that his car has been keyed so that they notice it and you destroy their happiness. That's that's envy, and it's usually two people. Jealousy commonly involves three people. Jealousy is something that somebody has, such as your wife, and she sees somebody who she thinks more attractive or funny or whatever reason, but she drifts towards that person and you're losing something. That's jealousy. So envy is coveting. Jealousy is losing. Jealousy involves three people. Now, back to envy. We cut divide envy into two components. Here we go clear back to ancient Greece. Aristotle um, divided one of the first people to divide uh, envy into two components. Good envy is, and the world should um, run on good envy. Good envy is emulating somebody else that's better than you are. And I didn't appreciate it, but that's how I got into medical school uh, because I had poor habits coming from a small farm I didn't have good study habits. I didn't know how to study. So I had to associate with good students in order for me to uh, learn how to study and get good grades. And that happened in medical school. So I, I subconsciously was doing um, good envy without understanding it and knowing it. And bad envy is, is that... Um, I kind of just dump on the pre-med students. So, oh, that guy's not as smart as he thinks he is. Or, you know, you disparage what they're doing or their study habits or doing something. So you try and cut them down and say, I'm as smart as that guy. I could get into medical school. Then if you don't get in, oh, I didn't want to go to medical school. They're a bunch of jerks or, you know, they're all weirdos. So you make up reasons to uh, cut them down or to justify why you failed. So that's that's the two divisions of 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 envy, and as I mentioned, the Christian component to com combat that is kindness. Um, next, um, how is the hierarchy of uh, perpetrator of the tall poppy syndrome? So the hierarchy, anytime you want, anytime you have a hierarchy, you have competitions. So that's why a lot of the internet companies, uh, I mean, they didn't know about the tall poppy syndrome either, but you know, the, it's the internet companies came in, they did away with walls and offices and tried to make everybody equal and get rid of the hierarchy because the hierarchy creates competition. And anytime there's competition, there's going to be the tall poppy syndrome. Because once again, the one in power, if somebody has power, they don't like to give power up. You have to take power. And we talked about that as that's how movements start. So there's a net, the net, the dynamics. I'm and in a way, it's a certain caste system. You know, if you look at, if you studied India uh, and their caste system, you know, the, the lower caste never didn't have um, the ability to climb out of the caste, even if they had 
good envy. That was what separated. Um, one of the separating factors, what made America was America, or even if you went back to England or, you know, France, they still have a saying in French, you know, that, you know, you can become a citizen, but you're not a Frenchman. And, you know, the whole feudal system of Europe and England with all their lords and chancellors and things. So anytime you have that hierarchy, you're going to have the tall poppy syndrome. That group, if they see, and that's why uh, even in government, when you see somebody coming up that, you, that you're afraid is going to take your position smarter than you are, win the election, what do you do? You try and cut them down. Going back to the original metaphor of the tall poppy in the government uh, and the people that opposed the governor. So how do you get, how do you prevent that hierarchy in society? Uh, you cut them down. So Rome, you know, in Rome and Greece, they had, they had their higher hierarchies clear back then. You know, to Rome. Uh, in the t ancient Rome, 25% of the population was slaves. And you're not going to have a slave try and come out of not being a slave without something bad happening to them. So that hierarchy in society or in your workplace uh, is the source of the tall poppy syndrome. So by understanding the emotional makeup of the tall poppy syndrome, and it can be a problem of the cutter or a problem of the tall poppy, you start to understand who you, you yourself are in the world, within your own dynamics, within your own family, within your own peer group, with your workplace, with your neighborhood. And, and um, you can see then translate that into the bigger picture of what happens nationally and look at at the elections more critically and internationally. And that drives you to, to self-reflect. And you're eventually looking outward, but in, in doing so, then you have to self-reflect. Just when I would describe the Will Smith, um, Chris Rock episode, uh, people stuck up for both both sides, you know? So if I say to you, uh, you like Norman Rockwell, the realist painter. And I said, well, Jackson Pollock is the greatest American painter. And you say, well, anybody could paint like that. He doesn't even paint. He just throws some paint on the floor. So you've just cut him down. But to me, listening to what you say, I've kind of passed judgment on you that that you have low self-esteem and you're, you're not very open to new ideas and to people. And that's how you grow from the thing saying, hey, sir, let me let me introduce you to Jackson Pollock. You're looking at him completely wrong. This is why he's such a great painter. And so you yourself grow from it. So that's why in the end, the, the book was, was a subtle, self-help book which is i intended that but i changed how i wrote the book to do it subtly without making it look like a self-help book just like i hope i've helped you grow and you know if you were in the city council because trust me if you're in the city council there's a lot of cutting down and you're not from la you i'm not in la anymore but you know uh, we just had a big blow up in the LA city council because two Hispanic people made some were caught on tape with two other Hispanic people making disparaging remarks about Afro Americans and and a couple of the people have resigned but two haven't so the fight is still going on but once you're in that even if you're even if you think you're a tall poppy within within the realm. When you're in that group, trust me, there's tall poppies trying to cut each other down. So yeah, you would, I, you'd, um, you'd be seeing yeah, a big thing. I um, you know, definitely seen a lot of that in in City Hall as well as the uh, you know, the state house. Um seems like to me that they have hierarchies there too. 
Yeah, of course they do. Well, look at, the, you know, I'll just use Nancy Pelosi be, uh, because she's a prominent politician, but within her hierarchy of um, the House of Representatives, if you study her very long, you, you can figure out very easily who her hierarchy are and it's, they're all Californians I can tell you there's very few Adam Schiff almost everybody that she puts on a committee uh, is at is going to be somebody from California she's very very high, high in her hierarchy it's very much the state that she comes from as far as my personal opinion she may say differently but you know it's not uh, I'll say Biden maybe checks more boxes. Uh, the box that um, that uh, Pelosi checks is California. But yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, and you see, there's there's a lot of good people. I mean, that's why some of the House of Representatives people there's 450 plus reps, and you know the hierarchy. You think, well, I'm a representative to the Congress, the National Congress. I'm a big person. Well, there's 450, and there's a lot of people like Nancy Pelosi, and a lot of people have tenure in there. So you may be a tall poppy, and you're, you know, we used to say, small. You're a big fish in the small pool. You're you're a big big fish if you left your little state. But now you're competing with all the national people, and all of a sudden, now you're a small fish in the big pond. So you're not such a tall poppy like you thought you were, and your chance of becoming a tall poppy, because that's a terrible pyramid uh, to get to that top spot with 450 people. But yeah, that's a hard climb, and there's going to be a lot of tall popping, trust me, within that system. And once you understand that concept, you'll see it occur every day. Maybe subtle, but you can figure it out. You can figure it out every time you pick up the newspaper. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And it even occurs in not, not just, uh, you know, federal government. It's also you see it in state government, and you see it in local governments as well. Uh, been there, done that. Yeah, I, I left. Uh, I now live in a very small town in the central coast of California. I left L.A. E even though uh, we'll just say I was in Long Beach. I I practiced 37 years. I saw 5,000 people a year. So within that time, I saw over 150,000 people, which is a third of the population. I knew a lot of people in town. And I could get my way politically if I needed a permit to do this or do that. Uh, but uh, I came to a small town uh, because I don't like crowds and waiting in lines and traffic and all, whatever, all my reasons. But I found that in my small town, which is why I left a small town, that the small town, the city council is, is more difficult than the big council that I was used to because of the tall poppy syndrome. You know, when you're in a small community, um, there are not a lot of options. So the option that's most open to everybody is cut somebody down. Um, why, why does competition, rivalries, and duels cause the tall poppy syndrome? So I brought duels into it. Duels are fascinating, were a fascinating study for me. They came into being around the 15th century. And as the dueling progressed through countries and societies, they, they developed codes. So you actually had a code of conduct for dueling. And in the end, dueling is just simply the tall poppy syndrome. You're going to cut the other person down. But if you follow the rules, then you could be justified in cutting that person down. So the first examples of the tall poppy syndrome I felt in America were, were duels. And if you remember, our good friend Alex Hamilton was cut down by a duel, unfortunately. And so that's a legitimate was, you know, our rules for, uh, we followed European rules that originally, but of course they kept getting watered down and more watered down. Andrew Jackson was in a duel, you know. Uh, as we came west, then 
dueling didn't lost all forms of of rules so the dueling cowboy i mean let however 18 i don't know when the last official gunshot duel was something i'll say 1860 i can't remember now i knew when i wrote the book but it's when we finally said you know you can't be having gunfights anymore well, that that's not true as you know it's still going on but but as far as the chapter on the old west uh, shoot them up two cowboys dueling it out so the dueling is actually the best example of the tall poppy syndrome because you're literally and figuratively cutting somebody else down but anytime you have competition so if you and i are competing for this same podcast job the good envy is i see you I like your mannerisms or something I like, some technique I like. So I try to emulate. So I think that's maybe the determining factor. So I'm going to try and emulate you to um, improve my speaking so that I can be as eloquent as you are and maybe get the job. That, once again, is good envy. Bad envy would be I'm going to... Uh, put the word out on the street that you're a bad person or maybe you're having an affair or something to taint your your personhood so that the person that's doing the selecting will hear about that and I can cut you down, not improve myself and get get the job myself by merely cutting you down. So that's that's why I said it was so prevalent in America because of our meritocracy and our competition we compete harder you know if you get if you get a job in Europe chances are pretty good and Japan for example Japan's a very egalitarian society if you get a job it's a job for life and that's just not the way America works so you have to keep to a certain extent earning that position that you have and if somebody else is after your position, then you've got to really improve yourself to maintain that position or cut that person that's knocking at your door to take your position away from you. So that's another reason I, I feel that it's so prevalent in America. It's, it's just still so unrecognized. The whole concept is unrecognized in our behaviors, just as our behaviors with politics is it's becoming known because we become so divided but in the end it's one big tall poppy machine now now how, how does that relate to the seven deadly sins so i and as i mentioned i'm big on trying to help people remember things just like uh envy envy is divided good envy bad envy Jealousy is three people, envy is two people, one is coveting something, one is losing something. So we need, in order to remember things, we need to, to um, have some sort of a, a mnemonic or something to help us remember. So I came up with the seven deadly sins because as I was reviewing the behaviors, the behavior, the three main be, bad behaviors of the cutter was bad envy was anger anger is a big cutter remember there's good anger and bad anger good anger is good anger helps you focus good anger is you direct all your energy at something important anger is having an obstacle that's in front of you and preventing you from something you want so let's say i'm guarding curry stephen curry and he drives by me and he scores the easy layup now bad envy would be the next time he drives by me i stick my foot out or i elbow and i foul him so he misses a shot good envy would be i at practice i work on my footwork so that i become faster and can move in front of him and prevent him from moving uh, by me and block a shot or his dribble. So bad envy is a number one driver of the cutter. 
in the tall poppy syndrome. Anger is another. Anger can be good and bad. Most of it's bad. Anger, actually, people are confused about anger. Ang anger hardly ever ends in violence or revenge. But when we think of anger, um, that's what we always think about. But that's not true. And anger actually helps you focus, as I was talking about with Stephen Curry. If I focus on my footwork, um, I'll improve myself. So there's a good component, and that's what anger management is about. And then we have pure laziness. In the Bible, it's called sloth. So you're just too lazy to work hard. You just cut people down because you're lazy. I don't, I don't want that job, you know. It's only for idiots. Oh, that person's a fool. So people are lazy. That's natural. Just that's a natural inclination for some reason. People are angry and people are envious. Those are the three cutters in the peer-to-peer. -peer. In the tall poppy, the bad component, bad features that they harbor are once again, pridefulness or hubris, lust, and greed. So I've just given you three, three bad emotions in the cutter and three bad emotions in the tall poppy. And the only seventh one of the seven sins that we've left out is gluttony. So if you can remember, if there's Christians out there who frequently know what the seven sins are, if you can remember the seven sins, you can re remember the main behaviors of the cutters and the main bad behaviors of the tall poppies. It's a mechanism of um, looking for the bad behavior. And, it, and it's also a mechanism for each bad behavior. Once again, in Christianity or the Bible, there's a virtue. And the uh, virtue of envy is kindness. As I mentioned, uh, I kind of modified the kindness. Servitude is really kindness. Uh, but I flip that because we're we're losing our Christianity as well in America. And so I kind of drifted away from the kindness Christian concept more to servitude and meaning that if you serve fellow man and you can serve them in any manner you want to serve them, if you're if you're a janitor, you can be a servant by serving the company that you take care of and do go beyond. If you're supposed to clean inside the building, you can pick up a little bit on the outside of the building as you leave. I, I have a most wonderful per, post person in the world. Uh, she, if there's a package delivered, she brings it up to my house and knocks on the door, rings the doorbell so she doesn't have to leave it. So somebody can see it there and steal it. She's even made me a key lime pie. We have a key lime, a key, a lime tree. I gave her some limes one day. And in return for that, I got a key lime pie. So that's what I call servitude. I have one of the greatest post people in the world. What's great about her, she just does her job, but she just does it serving people, which is what her job is about. I did the same thing I feel when I was, um, as a physician, you pay a doctor, so you think you you um, go that extra mile. Uh, that's serving your patient. I'd get up at night and come in and see them or get up on the weekend if they were in the hospital. I really serve my patients more than just being paid for. There's this term in the South um, that I kind of liked. I trained at Tulane that I mentioned, uh, which is a French term. You may have heard of it over Bur Birmingham as uh, lanyap. Lanyap. I don't know if you've heard. That's just something extra special. So it's like if you, the women might remember this more. They go into the cosmetic uh, department in the department store and they buy something they like 
And then the person there gives them a little sample or a little something of something else. That's called lanya. That's just a little something special for you buying something here. So in the end, I kind of like that lanyap. And if you just, if you're um, whatever you are, if you just say, if you're the company, if you serve your customer and you do a little lanyap, you give them a little something extra, everybody's going to be happy. It's really, really internally, it's kindness, but it's just uh, being kind and kind of the golden rule, but a little bit more even. It's always doing what you want, but it's it's doing just something special i mean if you meet somebody and they are just you, you have your first encounter just like you and myself today uh if there's just some connection something we do for each other at the end you post the podcast and you say it's the greatest podcast you ever had i mean how am i not going to like you so that's how you be a tall puppy Uh, you probably already mentioned something about the cancel culture as it relates to the tall poppy syndrome. Well, it's really a form of the tall poppy syndrome because they're cutting somebody down. So you, once again, you have to, so there is, there's a, the, the cancel culture can be, it can be true. It can be cutting down. Uh, they're cutting down, essentially the cancel culture is cutting somebody down. So the question for the viewer, once again, this is how you grow as a viewer. If you're not part of that cancel culture, as I see it happening every day, um, you, you see um, somebody that's cut down via the cancel culture. The question is, did, did they deserve to be cut down? So it's once again, deservingness. That's the justification of cutting somebody down. So was the cutter, so somebody's cut down. So a cutter cut somebody down. Now, was that a cutter had bad behavior? Did they have anger? Did they have envy? Were they lazy? Those are the big three uh, fears in there too. But did they, it's low self-esteem. So there's a lot of reasons cutters do things. The important people for the public cutting down is the justification. So you have to go through those mental things. And as I mentioned, the pro there's two problems with the, as I see it, with the cancel culture. One, there's a lot of collateral damage to it, um, meaning people in, say, some administration getting cut down uh, because they were in the administration and the president, for example, was a bad person or did something egregious but there's also the symbolism that goes uh, with that and so you i mean to a certain point now the cancel culture is using the white as a symbol of the past and you know i'm a white guy i didn't own any slaves i, I since i grew up in iowa i didn't have any Afro-Americans in my grade school. I didn't have any in my high school. I went to a private school, Catholic school, not exclusive school. It was rather poor school at that. I went to a Catholic school, an undergraduate medical school. We did have one in my class in high school. We did have one Afro-American. In college, I didn't see very many Blacks. In my medical school, I had no Black in my medical school class. Probably in my, although I eventually went to, I did go to Tulane, which was in the South, but I had in my class as a residency, I had no black person. So, I mean, I didn't really come in contact with blacks or Jews. It's amazing till I got out into society. So I was kind of a blank whiteboard. And so for me to get, uh, kind of thrown in with being white and because I'm white and I have a target on my back seems a little bit strange to me. And, I, and where I was tall poppied was the county hospital was 90% um, black and Hispanic. And for the most part, I've practiced there for 30 years with most of it uh, doing free time. 
So for me, all this seems so silly because there's so many good people out there that just get labeled. So that's how what? it happened. That's the cancer now, culture. Now what, now what if, you know, I call out something that I know is wrong, but it's popular, you know, in the culture. You know, and basically said, well, if you do not conform to the culture, we're going to cancel. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's what that's a big part of what's happening in our society today and politically just uh, everything. And that that's what I'm saying. And, and part of the symbolism as things are occurring. But, well, I, I mean, you see that. I mean, our politics, I think, is a good example. I can't believe. I can't believe that every Democrat thought that um, the they called it the non-inflationary package or the last package that we had, which was more caused more more inflation. We're already in an inflammatory period, partially because of the war in Russia and gas prices and stuff, but certainly government spending accelerates that process and so the last bill i think uh the democrats all voted for it and i just can't think that there must be some democrat that thinks this is a bad idea but you know uh, they're afraid to do it for they're not going to get a position within the party they're not going to be on a committee as we're talking about politics has that hierarchy uh, or, you know, it's so tight with the way people think that if they don't vote the party line, that they're not going to get reelected again. So I think what you're talking about dictates how politics thinks now. They're, they're one way or the other. It's very uncommon for a politician to go to the other side, even though it's good policy. I mean, Joe Mankin was a good example of that. Uh, he was one guy for a while, tried to buck the trend, but why he eventually didn't buck it, you know, he probably got something that we don't know about. So and why are we talking about the political climate here in, you know, in America? Do you believe that the tall poppy syndrome has ruined the political system in this country? Well, it's not the tall poppy syndrome. It's if you understand it, you can change the political system. I think if they understand it, uh, I, I mean, there, you, pretty much there's never a win-loss situation. In all life, you have, life is about compromise. Nobody gets exactly what they want. I mean, Elon Musk is not going to get exactly what he wanted with Twitter. He may have had what he wanted it to be, but he's not going to get that. And so there's nothing in life that, uh, I mean, if you, I mean, my life is, was not anything. I mean, I, some people want to be doctors and they want to go back and practice with their father, or their mother, or whatever, you know, but in the end, that's not how life is that that really works that way. My life just happened. And and, you know, it's very serendipity. I, you know, I'm small town, largest town in the country. Um, you know, everything with, for me was kind of a dichotomy. But you, uh, you have to, you have to flip the switch and, and think more about serving people and compromising and not having your way. I mean, in the end, you could use, uh, um uh, tom brady and his divorce is the tall poppy syndrome in the end maybe his wife didn't get her way she she didn't um think he was doing her fair share and cut him down uh for going back for another year so she she was out of compromising for him but we we have to we can't have our own way we can't we have to compromise and we have to give and take that's why I like servitude. If, if you're thinking servitude, chances are you're going to give more than you're going to take. And, you, you know, giving money, in the end, giving money is better than being selfish. 
there's very few selfish people are happy. They can't get enough of themselves. Um, and they can't make enough money. So the happiest people usually aren't rich people. You know, the happiest people frequently are are probably just low income people that are in, in the competition of making a lot of money and happy just being comfortable in their own skin and serving their fellow man. I'm sure there's studies on that, but that's kind of what my book was about. You don't have you don't have to be a tall puppy. You can just um serve people you know in the end you can't seek happiness happiness just happens in life and i can tell you i can tell you a lot of ways not to be happy and one of them's you know trying to be the big man and trying to make a lot of money and trying to have a lot of power you end up very empty i mean you know you look at warren buffett and bill gates you know they're they're giving all their money back away it, you know for them being rich wasn't part of their success or success was having a product that that helps society or moves society forward. That's that's kind of one way to be a tall poppy, the way you look at a business. Um, but in the end, money wasn't a big deal behind their success. Money just happened same way happiness happens. And in the end, their happiness is giving that money back to society in one way or another. This, this this is some really good information here. Uh, uh, so we're going to get ready to close. But again, for you know those of you who are watching and probably will be watching and listening, you know, in the future once this program goes into archives, uh, just wanted to you know give you the Webster's definition of what a tall poppy is. A person who is a tall, uh, tall poppies are people who stand out. You know, it could be anything. They could be an influencer. They can be an organizer. Uh, they can stand out in a particular, uh, you know, field. And sometimes that involves, you know, people, you know, being cut down because of it can be envy, it can be jealousy, it can be anger, it could be either one of those, you know, those things. Tall okay. poppy mm -hmm. refers to a person who has, uh, is, you know, he has, this person has great success, talent, or status. They are the best and the brightest in whatever they do. But see, that's why I had to change everything. That that comes exactly out of Australia. Australia made all the rules, and I studied Australia for a year. Mo most of the literature on the tall poppy syndrome comes from Australia, and they defined uh, that's a. If you go to the Australian Dictionary, which is this is probably where it came from. That's how Australia defines a tall poppy. But there are very few there. But that's why. I immediately came into the problem of your tall poppy is not my tall poppy and that there's different types of tall poppies and we divided into peer to peer. And then I had to even go another level and say, that is not a tall poppy. My tall poppy is a servant, which doesn't make that definition. And if you use, if you use my definition of a tall poppy, it's, it's inclusive. It is everybody in the world is a tall poppy if you serve so what what is the opposite of the tall poppy syndrome well the tall poppy syndrome is bad envy it's, it's um coveting what the tall poppy has and want to destroy it that's why it's the number one problem and that's why kindness is the answer to that but it's the coveting of of what somebody else has and and either coveting that asset itself or trying to destroy their happiness. And that's really a deadly sin. I mean, you know, there murder is a deadly sin. Um, but you know, there's not that much murder. 
But I can tell you there's a lot of tall poppy, there's a lot of coveting and a lot of tall poppy syndrome happens every day. So we, we got to forget about the big name items and think about the little name items, which are just being kind to your fellow man, just being so-called human and serving people. You know, if somebody walks in in front of you, the door, open the door for them. You don't have to go in first. What's the, what's the big deal? Uh, this, this, this is a really great, you know, information. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I never heard of this term before. Um, so I learned a great deal today. Now, aren't you, let me ask you, aren't you a better man for this? Aren't you going to look at life very differently yourself? how you view your family, your workplace, politics. That's why I like the tall poppy syndrome and the and my book because it's really um, a really self-help and growing book. But you you can evaluate most everything in society if you get this little concept. You, and I don't know if you read the Bible, but if you if you read the Bible, the Bible's full of the tall poppy syndrome. And if you understand the tall poppy syndrome, you'll have a, be a much better understanding of the Bible. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's definitely a good thing to know out there. And I, you know, definitely will, you know, evaluate things, you know, a little bit more, you know, deeper, you know, now that I have an understanding of what the tall poppy syndrome is. Well, you got now, just a minute. So you got Adam and Eve. Here you are, familial. Um, bad envy you know adam and eve uh or cain and abel i mean adam and eve is different adam that's quickly eve is prideful which is very unusual i mentioned pride is usually found in the male but the very beginning of the bible in genesis here's eve she's prideful of the fruit she cons adam into doing it with her and god cuts them down so right off the top there's an example of the tall poppy syndrome you turn a few more pages, and then you have Cain and Abel, familial bad envy. And Cain kills Abel. Why? Because uh, the gifts that were presented to God, God chose uh, Ab Abel, and Cain should have used good envy. And the next presentation, he should have given a better offering than C Abel's. What does he do? He does a simple thing. He kills him. So you're only a few pages into the Bible and you've already seen two great examples, one of pride and one of bad envy. You, you, you've hardly gotten anywhere. Oh, uh, what about uh, so what about Abraham, Sarah, and the uh, you know, the servant, uh, Hagar, yeah. Well, they um, so well, that was justified, right? Because it, it's the lineage, but one was an illegitimate boy, son, so he got passed over. So it was an example of the tall poppy syndrome, but it was a justified tall poppy syndrome because the first one was um, servants and the second one was a wife, right? Uh, uh, what about uh, on the same page? Jacob? Jacob and Esau. Well, maybe that's the one I was talking about. I, I might have, I I might have them mixed up, but um, both of those are examples. Um, and I I have to go over it because I don't know that as well. But that's an example. The first one's example. This is example. The next really fantastic example is the first kingdom of Israel, which was Saul. Saul tries to cut down David, then that's bad envy. Then um, David is covetous of the woman, right? And he has sex with somebody else's wife. And then he has that person killed so that they don't know because he's off fighting the war and he and there's no way his wife could be pregnated because he's not at home and so um david has that soldier killed so it's an example of jealousy and bad envy all in one 
So the uh, bad envy when Saul tries to kill him, David and uh, Joseph and the Joseph right has eleven brothers and they try to kill him right. Bad envy, and of course more more of it's carried on when he goes to Egypt, and in Egypt you know he gets elevated and then there's jealousy and he gets put back in prison. So I know we're trying to end, but I'm just telling you. If you, yeah, if you if this, you get it, so those five uh, examples see a lot of right it. there uh, are in Genesis. It's in it's that's in the first book, and you'll understand the emotions better because the Bible also interchangeably uses uh, envy and jealousy, and if you understand those, the correct usage of those terms, it actually helps you understand that particular aspect of the Bible Bible because they're using them incorrectly, frequently. They're not interchangeable. But anyway, uh, the Bible is actually a big source of studying and understanding the tall poppy syndrome as well. Now, um, how uh, how can someone purchase your book or how can they find you? If they wanted to, you know, get more information about you and what you do as well as your book. So the best way is just my website, D-O-U-G. G A R L A N D dot com, Doug Garland dot com. All that uh, on that up comes um, the book, which you, and then you can order. It's available on Amazon. It's available everywhere on websites like um, uh, but the easiest way is just through my website or just go directly to Amazon dot com. Also on my website, uh, I have podcasts, blogs, scientific articles. I introduced uh, the tall poppy syndrome into medicine, which has not been described in the field of medicine. So I have six or seven articles regarding that. I did some Quora. So all those are on the website. I'm actually updating my website and doing another website. My new website is Doug Garland, or is the tall poppy syndrome.org. And I'm going to move all my tweets and all my blogs and everything on that because it's cumbersome for my personal website. And then my website will just have select podcasts and, and um, blogs and articles on it so that you can see most everything on the first page because it's goes on and on. And as, as you know, People don't go past the first page. So I'm trying to change it up a little bit. But right now, just go to duckgarland.com. Uh, Dr. Garland, it was certainly a pleasure for you to uh, be on the uh, podcast today. Truly, this is some very valuable information. You know, and I learned a lot, too. That's part of the deal I told you would when we started. So you'll see. Yep. You'll start looking at the world through the lens of the tall poppy syndrome, and it's you'll you're going to grow as a person. I'm telling you, so you get it. It's fun. All right, you know I may have to. You know I may be interested in purchasing a book in the future, as you know as well. Uh, I think there also too that uh, there needs to be some workshops and seminars, you know, on this as well. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, really don't know about that, you know, what it entails. Well, I agree. There is a workshop actually in Canada. Canada is a egalitarian country like um, like Australia. I mean, the entities known in Canada, it's known in England, but it doesn't occur like it occurs in Australia. But in Canada, they... It occurs, you know, women have the glass ceiling in the workforce. That's one thing. The glass ceiling is called for women. Uh, women are subjective to bullying. Bullying's a little different. Bullying has to do with power. We're actually, bullying, usually you bully down. Somebody below you, you keep the power by bullying on them. Cutting down is different because you're frequently cutting down somebody higher than you. So it's a little twist. But anyway, uh, there's uh, one of the universities there, they studied uh, females with um, 
Paul Poppy syndrome and did it occur? And of course, they found that it occurred in the workplace. So they did actually the you know, that company that group then that did that study, they put on an annual um, Paul Poppy syndrome conference of it occurring in the workplace. It's mostly for females. Mostly it was just short lived because of COVID. It went off kind of off the air because of COVID when everything was shut down. But there was there was an attempt actually if you Google tall poppy syndrome, uh, you'll see that come up. All right, um, I would definitely. But I agree with mind. you. Good good plug. I agree. Maybe we'll do that. Okay. Um... And uh, that would do it for this segment of Talk Show Presents. Um, hope that the information here was informative. Uh, please make sure if you have any questions, um, um, this will be posted on uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. Uh, you may have some questions uh, or or uh, commentary or things of that nature, or you may want to you know, get in touch with Dr. Garland. We uh, definitely encourage you to, you know, to do that and get more information. Uh, and and uh, constructive commentary is always welcome. And that would do it for this segment of Talk Show Presents. I'm Keith Williams, your host. Uh, thank you for being a part of this podcast and we'll see you next time.